I wanted to talk about memory, trouble with memory. This is a talk I probably just should have done years ago, but I don't know. I just didn't think it was that interesting. So, and maybe it isn't. You can tell me at the end. So if you don't like the talk, I'll help you with selecting the button to push. And if you do like the talk, you know, it, the green one is helpful. Okay, so at the end. Cool. Um, so uh, <clears throat> she's covered all kinds of things, so I'm not going to bother with this too much, um, uh, except for we have a startup, J Clarity. We make uh, performance diagnostic tooling and tooling to help people uh, find out what's going on in their application. And uh, I showed some video of Jay Onsen. It's an unconference that was actually modeled after JCrete, which is another unconference that we co-founded uh, with Dr. Heinz Kibbutz. And as the name suggests, we actually have that on the island of Crete every summer. It's really nice. So we say it's the hottest conference on the planet <laughs> for our definition of hot. Right. Um, and some other stuff. Right. Okay. So let's ask, start by asking questions, right? Because every good presentation has to ask questions. Okay. What are your performance trouble spots? Just shout them out. What's the thing that you believe gives you the most performance grief, you know, when you're dealing with throwing a system out into production? Immature developers. Immature developers. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> we had that last night, didn't we? <laughs> no, we did. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any ideas? <laughs> Technical of nature? G sorry, GC. So everybody's saying GC. Okay, GC is cool. What's that? Browser what? Browser rendering? Yeah, don't get me started. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah, our, our client container is wonderful, isn't it? Who loves it? Nobody put up their hands. Okay, cool. Uh, so what is your performance trouble spot? Nobody said database interactions? Where are we, like, all working for Oracle now or something? <laughs> <laughs> really, cool. Sorry? Network latency. Network latency. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, so we, I mean, we're around here. Right, so, so I'm going so to just, let's try this exercise. Since nobody put up their hands, I'm going to assume your hands aren't working, right? So let's see, you guys over there, put your hands up. Everybody over here, put your hands up. Everybody over here, put your hands up. And I think you guys can keep your hands down, right? And everybody in the back, put your hands up. I don't see all the hands up, both hands up. It's not working. It's a good stretch, right? There you go, after lunch, stretch. Okay, you guys are all suffering from memory problems. You guys probably aren't. <laughs> and this is what we're saying, right? We're saying about 70% of all the applications I run into are bottlenecked on some sort of memory issue, right? And this is why I said, okay, probably time to write a talk about this because not only um, are people bottlenecked on this issue, they don't actually even realize it. They don't even see it. It's, it's not even visible to them. So part of this talk is to tell you how you're bottlenecked on it and, you know, why and what's happened. And the other part is, you know, to give you some help in one recognizing it and the other one is, is trying to fix it. And, and no, garbage collection is very often not at fault. Now, we can do a lot with garbage collection tuning to hide the memory problems, but, you know, that's pretty much all we're doing is we're hiding it. Uh, if you really want to solve the problem, you really need to go and to the core of the problem. Okay, so the question is, do you use Spring Boot? Cassandra? Or, just to be fair, any other NoSQL solution? Apache Spark? Any hands? Yeah, we got it, okay. Uh, or any other big data solution? Log4j? Logback? Okay, I hate to ask this one, JDK logging? Nobody. You guys are all crazy. Actually, we use JDK logging. <laughs> That's right. Um, right. Or any j logging jam for uh, JSON. Who here uses any form of JSON? I should see the whole room hand go up, right, unless your arms are broken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Or almost any marshalling protocol. Ecom caching products. Any caching? Yeah, you got it? Okay. Hibernate? So on? So on, so on. If you use any of these, then you're very likely in the 70% of people that are suffering from memory issues. 
right? And, and the list just goes on and on and on of things that are actually just not, re not really memory aware. And, and so, um, you know, really the, the question is, you know, what are the problems that these things cause and, and what can we do about it, right? So we have high memory churn rates. We have many temporary objects. We can have large live data sets. That's going to cause a whole other set of problems because you have inf inflated uh, live data set sizes. And this can be caused by what we call loitering. So we just did this a couple of weeks ago. Somebody said, hey, we got this big problem with GC pauses. You look at it and go like, yeah, we know how to reduce your GC pauses. Uh, first off, um, get rid of the memory leak. <laughs> right? Um, and once you get rid of the memory leak, you have all these other loitering objects that are around. So these are, in this case, it was like jetty sessions. So they had a large time, like 24 hour or 48 hours, some long, they, these things were around for like days longer than they needed to be. And so we just like turned the session timeout back and then all of a sudden their memory footprint went down and all of a sudden their pause time started getting smaller. And going like, wow, okay, so you know, how does that work, right? Um, you know, a few war stories. Uh, reduced allocation rates from 1.8 gigabytes per second to zero. Yes, that's not a, that's not a typo. It actually is zero uh, bytes per second. TPS jumped from 400,000 to 25 million, right? So we're not talking about small gains here. We're talking about the potential to get exceptionally large gains if you pay attention to this problem, right? And we stripped out, so I, I gave my usual logging rant at a, at a workshop that I gave. I was in the Netherlands uh, about a year or so ago. And um, that night, they went and stripped all the logging out of their uh, transactional monitoring framework that they were using, which wasn't getting them the performance they wanted, which is why I was there giving them the workshop in the first place. And uh, when they stripped out all their logging, their throughput jumped by a factor of four. Right? And they were going like, oh, okay, so now our performance problem not only went away, we've been tuning this thing so long that actually when they got rid of the real problem, it went much faster than they needed, like twice as fast as what they needed to go. Um, and, you know, so there's a, another product company we're working with, and this, the list of problems here, I mean, I could make this list a lot longer. We just do the whole hour on, you know, my how great a hero I am at fixing these problems. Uh, but that's not really the point here. You know, the point is that there are some really significant gains can be made if you just pay attention uh, to how you're utilizing memory. Um, allocation sites, you know, so how do we form an allocation site? Well, here I have a foo, foo equals new foo, lots of foos in there, I guess. And, and when you break this out into the byte code, then you can see you get this new thing and you can see pretty much that's, every time you do a new, that's, that's, this is what happens, right? And this is gonna cause an allocation uh, uh, to occur. And there's a number of different ways that this allocation can actually occur. We can go down what's known as a fast path, or we can go down to a small path, or it's even possible uh, that we have, you know, we have this wonderful technology inside the JVM called a JIT, and the JIT looks for optimizations. One of the optimizations that it can actually perform is say, okay, I'm not really going to allocate this this way. I'm going to just basically unbox the values inside this object and place these values on the stack directly. So I'm not going to do a heap allocation at all, right? So so small objects may be optimized and it might be possible that the, that the optimization or that call site is just going to be eliminated from the code uh, uh, just completely. It's one thing we can do. Um, okay, so we're sort of talking about allocations, so you know we get a little bit of understanding about Java Heap. Normally, when I talk about Java Heap, I talk about it in the context of garbage collection, and in this time, I'm going to talk about it in the context of the allocators. Now. There's always this interplay between the garbage collector and the allocators. They sort of have to cooperate with each other in order to keep things rolling. And, um, you know, if they don't really cooperate, then you get uh, full stop the world pauses where the garbage collector says, you've just run out of memory. So because you've just run out of memory, I'm just going to stop everything that's happening. I'm going to take complete control of the heap, and then I'm just going to clean things up, right? So that's like the we don't have any cooperation world. But that's not today's world. Today's world, we have a lot of what I would call uh, cooperation happening. So we get um, very concurrent or much more concurrent collectors in, in our, in our uh, 
uh, we, we just have these available to us, like uh, Shenandoah's coming, ZGC's coming. These are a lot more concurrent. And because they're a lot more concurrent, the allocators and the collectors have to cooperate so that the collectors aren't interfering with the allocators so much. But that means that we need to give work to the allocators that the garbage collector would normally do or give work to the allocators to help the garbage collector so that it can run concurrently. So generally what happens is we're going to take that long pause, we're going to make it shorter for one of the times we do have to pause, but we're going to do that by putting work onto the allocation threads. And when we put the work onto the allocation threads, we're going to slow your allocations down a wee bit. So therefore, our application throughputs are just going to take a bit of a hit, right? No free lunch. Pay me now, pay me later. The, the trick is to find the balance between how much work can we give the allocators as opposed to how much work do we want to dump onto the garbage collector. OK. Um, right. So we have these number of spaces here. We have an Eden space, a nursery. That's where objects are generally allocated. We have a survivor space, and we have a tenure space. Each of these different spaces contributes to problems in a different way. So we sort of, when we're looking at tuning the garbage collector or tuning our application, we want to see the impact that they have on each of these, in, these spaces individually. OK, so let's talk about need and allocation first. We generally have this top a heat pointer. And then what we're going to do is when we execute some code here, here's my very cleverly written code. And you can see that I got a couple of foos and a bar and a byte array. And so we're going to allocate the foo first, which means I'm going to do what's known as a bump and run. So I'm going to bump the pointer up, claim the memory, and then I can just dump the data in there. And then, then I got to go through a few barriers to make it visible to everybody. And life is good. OK. And then the bar does the same thing. And then, of course, I have a byte array, right? And you know, see, I'm just going to bump the top of heat pointer up there, right? So when I finally fill the space, then of course the collector is going to come along here and evacuate all the data, all the live data out. Okay, so now we're sort of developing a cost model here. So if you, if you want to know why my pause is long or what's taking so long, you have to sort of develop a cost model. And the cost model here says, gosh, if I have a lot of live data and when I fill a space and I copy it out, then of course that's going to take some time. OK? It takes time to allocate it, and it takes time to copy out the live stuff. Um, so we have a couple of different throttles that we can use here to control things. One of them is that we can control the allocation rates. That's in our code. Or we can control the size of the buffer. That's a configuration of the JVM. Right? So those are primarily the two throttles that we can use to, to help ourselves. OK. In a multi-threaded application, if we just use this very naive scheme, of course, we're going to have a really hot pointer because we have all of these threads that are trying to allocate, and they're all going to try to bump this pointer up. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use a common technique when we have a hot lock, because this will create a hot lock because we have to put the barriers around the pointer. What we're going to do is we're going to do some, the equivalent of some striping. And in this case, what the striping is is known as these thread local allocation blocks. So initially, each thread, when they start up, they're going to get a chunk of memory that they're going to allocate from heap. And they're going to say, I can allocate into there. OK? And <clears throat> now we're not competing for that hot lock anymore. We're just visiting it when we need to get a new T-Lab. And this, of course, creates some of its own issues. Um, so, for instance, we could have like uh, a couple of threads allocating things. You can see we've allocated foo and allocated bar, and and uh, and we have also allocated this byte array. Now the byte array is too big; it doesn't fit into a T-Lab, so that has to go out into the general allocation space. But everything else fits into a T-Lab, and uh, you know, as you can imagine, the problems come when you get to here. Right now, what do I do? So. Well, I'm allowed to waste up to 1% of the T-Lab, which basically means that once I pass that red line that I've drawn up there, which is um, not representative of 1%, in case you didn't notice. So not to scale, is that what they say? Um, so we're allowed to waste up that, which basically means if we're past that threshold, they're saying, OK, now let's go get a new T-Lab and start allocating into the new T-Lab. So we get some memory wastage here. But that's better than the alternative, which is basically saying, I'm below the threshold, 
let's try to allocate here. Oops, fail. Protect from buffer overrun. Roll back. Get a new T lab. Now do the allocation, right? As you can imagine, that's a lot more expensive. So if you have these situations occurring quite frequently where you can't allocate because you're below the T-Lab threshold, uh, well, the T-Lab waste percentage, but your thing is going to overflow the buffer, um, then that's a condition, if you can recognize it, you can adjust that waste percentage and get rid of these failed allocations. And that can make some difference in, perf in the performance of your allocators. Okay. Um, tenured space is, is different. And, and how tenured space works is different and now with G1 than it was with generational collectors. I'm just going to talk about generational collectors here because uh, the G1 comes with its own set of issues uh, that are completely different. Um, and as you can see, what happens is that we're going, we're going to have this thing called a free list here. So because we don't have another space to evacuate in, which is something that G1 solves, um, we can't take all the live data and copy it out. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to maintain a free list. The free list is going to tell us where we can make the allocation from. So we have, in addition, uh, you know, when we're doing the alloca allocations here, well, actually, it's going to be the garbage collection threads that are going to be mostly doing the allocations here. Um, we, you can see that we have to do all of this free list maintenance, and there's some other work that needs to be done in order to help the garbage collector out. So one of them is that we have to maintain card sets. So every time we have a pointer mutation, this is where mutation rates become important in, in the performance of your application. Every time we have, you know, foo is pointing to bar, and we say, oh, it's not pointing to bar anymore, but it's actually pointing to fa or some other object, then if we have that, if we have foo and tenure and the other data in young, then I want to maintain that pointer information in a separate data structure. So every time we do that swizzle with the pointer, then I have to update that other data structure um, in, order to, uh, in order to help the garbage collector out. So that's like an extra cost that you get uh, on top of the allocation. Um, right. Data and tenure tends to be long-lived, and the amount of data and tenured will affect uh, the garbage collection pause times. Also, right, right, so I forgot to mention that what we see is that when you do an allocation from a free list, it's about 10 times more expensive than actually doing an allocation in young generational space. So the question is, when would your thread do decide to allocate in tenured space as opposed to allocating in Eden space? Well, the answer is, if the allocation is deemed too big, that it, large enough, okay, there's going to be a threshold for the different collectors, and they're going to say, okay, I don't want to do that allocation there. I want to do it in tenured. So as an example, the threshold for uh, a con mostly concurrent mark sweep collector is 50% of Eden. If you're larger than 50% of Eden, then that allocation will automatically occur in tenured space. And there's some other education conditions where these things can happen. Okay, so what are the problems we run into? Well, we have high memory churn rates, many temporal objects. And what that's going to do is quickly fill Eden. That means that it's going to give you frequent young GC cycles. And it also has this other side effect, which is kind of a strange one. We have two different ways of aging data. We have time, like as in wall clock time. So if we have a session timeout of 30 minutes, then of course that data is going to stay in heat for 30 minutes. Now the question is, how many garbage collection cycles is it going to face? I don't know. No idea. I do know that if it faces 15 of them, it's going to end up in tenured. Well, 6 or 15, depending on what the tenuring threshold is. So that's the second way I have of aging the data. The second way of aging the data is how many garbage collection cycles has it actually faced? And if it's faced that many of them, then I'm going to have to copy that data off into tenured. Now, why do I care about this? Well, I know that if I can collect the data in Eden, actually, you know, the cost, what's the cost of collecting dead data in Eden? Zero. Nothing. There is no cost. I'm only copying live stuff. I leave the dead stuff behind. So I never mark, never touch, never do anything with the dead stuff. We just move the live data out. So it's the live data that costs. So by aging faster, because I have frequent GCs, 
I'm actually end up copying a lot more data than I should. And I'm putting it into a space that's a lot more expensive to collect. Someone look, you look confused. Any questions at this point? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of strange, okay. Um, so I call it premature promotion. That's promoting data in tenured sooner than it should be, right? Um, and again, you know, what are the knobs that we have to turn to control this? Well, the first one, and the one that's probably gonna have the biggest effect, is gonna be allocation rate. We can make the buffer size bigger to accommodate the higher allocation rate, but still not gonna get a, um, rid of the effects of having to allocate all of this memory, right? And it's, you know, it'll decrease the copy cost, so you get some benefits from doing that. Um, allocation is quick, very quick in Java, much quicker than in most runtimes. Um, but quick times a large number is still a large number. Right? So that means it's just going to be slow. Um, so we find that it doesn't really matter what platform you're on. We sort of get this benefit of lowering the allocation rates. It's sort of on this curve. So I'd say that any time you're above one gigabyte per second, and you remember, right, we tend to allocate the buffer 100 bytes at a time. Right? So it's not that any individual, I mean, if we did it a, a gig at a time, I mean, it would probably take, uh, the, each individual allocation takes the, the same amount of time, but if we're doing it 100 at a time, then of course you have a frequency issue. And, and you know, the frequency issue seems to be really bad when you cross this one gig threshold, approximately. And by the time you get it below 300 megabytes per second, um, then pretty much I'm just going to ignore that problem. In between, it's sort of like, well, I may or may decide to do something about it depending upon, you know, what, what other things that are going on. Okay. Um, next problem is live, uh, large live data sets or inflated data set sizes, uh, as I mentioned, because of loitering. And really in this case, um, we get inflated scan for roots time. So that means that every time we do a garbage collection, we have to find the root set, which means I have to go through all the data to figure out who's pointing into that young generational memory pool or Eden survivor. Um, and that's just something that's linear with the size of, with, linear with the, the amount of data that I have to scan through. So if I have more data, it's just simply gonna take longer, right? I get reduced page locality. I get inflated compaction times. We get increased copy costs. And it's very likely that you just have less space to copy to, which means that the JVM has to do more work to figure out how to do the compaction and it has less room to work with, so it may not do as, as good a job uh, with the compaction, right? And, and here's a nice little chart that we do here. And you, you notice the one on the left, right? The one on the left is actually, an in, you just look at the red dots at the bottom. Forget all the other noise. I probably should have taken it out because it's just like lots of noise. But if you look at the red dots at the bottom, that's the increased occupancy uh, primarily of tenured space. And if you look at the red dots on the other side, do you see any correlation in the slopes of an imaginary line there, right? That's what, exactly what you're seeing. You're seeing the direct correlation of the uh, additional copy cost, but simply by having more data in heap. It's a nice chart. Um, if we have unstable live data set size, or what we normally would say is a memory leak, then, of course, you're just going to eventually run out of memory. And that's going to be really bad for performance, yeah? <laughs> so each app, each app thread is going to throw in out of memory error and will terminate uh, because it can't satisfy the allocation. And when all of the non-daemon threads are finished, then basically the JVM will shut down and it'll give you throw the um, out of memory error that we all love, right? Cool. Um, I'd like to talk about this, but I've decided I'm not going to right now, but I'll get back to it because this is quite fun. It's a fun bit of technology. Instead, let's look at some code here, right? How much time do I have left? Where's my moderator? She doesn't know. It's 20 after. Uh, okay. 
So I got this goofy little application that I wrote, and it's really got lots of fun. There's lots of opportunities in here for criticizing the code and everything, so please send your comments along. <laughs> I love to say you're wrong. Okay, so what do we have here? So I got this application. Of course. There's nothing on the screen. Why would there be anything on the screen? That's, I didn't want you to see the code. <laughs> okay. So, now you can see the code. Uh, actually, you can't. Yes. <laughs> Strategically positioned well. Okay, so I have this thing set up that it's actually going to run. And we can see it's running, 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 running. And it's doing, what's it's doing? It's like it's, it basically, I, I said, you know, I want you to, I'm making a guess here. Uh, you know, Mastermind, who's played Mastermind? Does anyone not know what Mastermind is? Okay, no colors, just numbers. So what I did was I said, okay, here's the number sequence, and then I, mm, well, I said, you know, imagine that all of the possible color sequences were there. I said, you know, try to find that one. So what it does is it does some logic to search through and try to figure out uh, what the correct answer is, and then it will ask, come back and ask me and say, okay, um, is this the correct answer? And eventually, it'll come up with the correct guess. So there's my score, three zero. So I said out of 100,000 numbers, um, I'm going to choose three. Tell me which three I chose. So it came back here and said it's zero, one, 50,002. And it took, more importantly, it took about 11 seconds to do that. We can run it again. And when I'm running these really boring performance demos, that's when you can ask questions. Uh, is it run? Yeah, it's nine. So, so it's gotten faster because it's going through some warm up here. And eventually it'll just stabilize on some number. I think the answer is like something like 8.6 seconds if my demo runs correctly. Yeah, 9.6. Run the test again. Hopefully the demo's in the correct configuration. Da, 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 da. It's fun, fun, fun. Oh, okay, 8.2, excellent. Okay, so now, now it seems to be efficiently warmed up and it should be around 8.3, 8.5 seconds, whatever. It doesn't really matter. The point is we have a sort of a magnitude area where this will run. Now, so the question is if we want to make this run faster, we have to figure out, okay, what's the problem? I'm going to spare you the analysis, but we're going to say that allocation rates are the problem. Uh, actually, I'll show you the last part of the analysis that will help you. So let's open up some tool. This is our GC analysis tool. I collected a GC log. That one right there. So it's going to load it up and it's going to say, uh, let's give me all kinds of information here about what's going on. But really what I'm looking for is allocation rates. Ah, there's my allocation rates. You can see my allocation rates are basically wavering between seven gigs and three and a half gigs or so. So that's above the one gig limit, would you say? Yeah, okay, cool. So we can successfully say that if we were to do something with the allocation rate with this application, it should run faster, yeah? Everybody agree? Okay. So the question is, where's the hot allocation site? How are we going to find that? Uh, memory profiler. I'll use Visual VM. Boom. As you can see, I was making sure it worked before here. <laughs> I've done some crazy things in the past where the demo just didn't work for whatever reason. Now I test them. Don't up JDKs, you know, all the standard stuff you shouldn't do. Okay, so it's, let's attach the memory profiler here. This is just Visual VM. Uh, for those of you who have not seen it, you can get it open source GitHub. Um, you can probably do the same thing with uh, Mission Control. Um, is Mission Control bundled with 11? I don't think, I think they've debundled it. It's bundled, it's still bundled? It was bundled, yes, as was Visual VM. And I think they've debundled it from 11. Anyways, it doesn't matter. So we're looking for frequency events. So I'm looking for allocated objects here. So let's go to our application here. Let's clear it out and run it again. And let's see if anybody can tell me what the hot allocated object is. <laughs> Any guesses, anybody? <laughs> undo, plus 
Oh, right, undo pause ref. Good choice. Excellent. I love it. Okay, let's go see where that is. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to take a snapshot here, and we're going to open it up, and we're going to say, okay, somebody in here is just doing something like really nasty, right? Creating all these objects. So now I can go back to source code. Okay, now this is where, now, now be brave, right? Oh, hold on, let's shut all this stuff down. Yeah. Uh, we don't need any of this stuff anymore. And board. So it's a score. Ah, look at that. Now, who wrote this code? <laughs> who would create a new object in a loop that's obviously being run millions and millions of times? Duh, right? Okay. Uh, so what can we do? Well, okay, let's, uh, let's reuse it. And, of course, we need one here, so. so we'll just hoist that allocation out here. Now, how many people here believe this is going to make a difference? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. For those of you, the, for those of you who don't believe it's going to make a difference, I want to hear why. <laughs> okay. Actually, let's do it this way, because I think some of you are probably going like, I don't know. So, how many people here believe that this isn't going to make a difference? <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Remember, I set up the demo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, and the answer is cross fingers. Let's run the test. It's not going to make a difference. What's that? Yes. There you go. Yes. Let's explain this. Now this goes back to our escape analysis thing. I can run it again. Should, after it warms up, yeah, we'll probably go. What? You're going to be kidding. Awesome. Go figure. Okay. That's the first time this one's ever come off. That's really good. I, I mean, literally, this demo is like years old. Never come off. Okay. This just shows you. Anyways, okay. Uh, so we're, we're, we're right in about here. Okay. So what's happening here? Well, what's really what's happening is this uh, technology called escape analysis is helping us out here. It's changing. It's helping us avoid our stupidity. I shall we say, who the developer who put that stupid code in there, <laughs> right, um, has just been saved by Hotspot. You know, so what's the score? Well, let's go take a look. Well, it's a Boolean and two ints. So rather than allocate this over and over and over and over and over again, let's just drop this on a stack and just get rid of the allocation site altogether. Right? And you can, and you can, look, at, you can look at it. Uh, let's go back here and say, like, okay, it has local scope. It doesn't, go, it doesn't go outside of the scope. So I have complete control over everything that happens to this object here. There's no side effects or anywhere in the application. So I can safely eliminate that allocation spot in this particular case, right? OK, so why did the profiler complain? Well, the profilers instrument the code. And when they instrument the code, what they do is they'll say, pass that object into this other object, so now it's outside of the scope of this method, it's escaped. So the profiler is lying to us. Okay? Classic case of lying. Okay, so cool. So we've been lied to. Well, we made the code maybe, I don't know. That's not better. Okay, so, so what's the real problem then, right? So let's, let's see if we can find a real problem. Oops, I should have showed you the allocation rate. The allocation rates were identical. Um, but I forgot to do that. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to add a zero here just for grins. Just for fun. I'm going to bring up Visual VM again. Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> I thought you were saying time's up. Just before the last dramatic part of the demo, right? Drum roll. 
Okay, here we go. Uh, profiler is memory settings. Oh yeah, everything looks cool, of course. Why wouldn't it? Just checking to make sure. Get rid of that. Uh, frequency events, so, oops, wrong direction. Let's do that back over here and run the test. And any thoughts this time? Yeah, probably something to do with this big integer, right? Or this interay. So we can take a look in the interay. When we look at the interay, there's some goofy code down here doing something. Uh, right. So the point is we can, we can go into this code and we can make the changes. And when we make the changes, this is going to make the speed up that we need. In other words, this is going to run in under half a second once we fix this problem with the big integer in this array. Okay? And these, these are not big changes in the code. So these are just two little small changes in the code. But I'll, I'll leave that as, a, as an exercise for the imagination rate uh, for the moment because I'm not sure about how much time we have. Oh, 15 minutes. Oh, I could have done it. What's that? Okay, I could have done it, but I'll, I'll leave it like this, right? So instead of like taking 10 seconds to run, just by making these changes by to the algorithm where we, we have this hot interray allocation and the use of big integer when we actually don't really need it for this particular problem, um, you know, we can reduce the allocation rates considerably. And as I mentioned before, this, this application will run in half a second now. That's how much of a difference that it will make. I probably should prove it to you, but I'd rather move on. <clears throat> yeah, it's going to take a while this way, so I'll just exit. <clears throat> Let's go back to slides. Oh, eh. Could write code, I guess. It's demo time. So you can see that escape analysis made a big difference. Um, and there's a, a lot of other optimizes, optimizations in the JIT engine that can help you. But I would say that the first thing to do is just look at the memory efficiency of your application and, and try to use the, gar the garbage collector will tell you if you're allocating a lot, right? If you do the right calculations. So uh, Sensum is our tool for um, that we use to actually do our analysis. And one of the things that we'll regularly look at is the allocation rate, just to see is this, is this a hot allocating uh, application? Do we have a large uh, memory footprint, right? So th those are the two things that we'd probably want to try to work to reduce in order to uh, per improve the performance of the applications. Um, so, you know, just so, again, let the garbage collector tell you what's going on and then just move naturally from there to use the profilers. Be aware that Hotspot is running under the hood, and so the code that you've written is not necessarily the code that you're actually, is actually going to be running, so it can modify it and mutate it quite a bit. And um, yeah, um, so in that case, I would be happy to take questions. I, I like prefer longer Q&As to shorter ones. Yes, Steve. Kind of confused looking. <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. Um, you mentioned a session sort of locked memory, right? The subject to the 30 minute rule until the session goes away and then all the pointers disappear. Right. Um, and so um, it's, that's the session memory. Yes. Right. So you mentioned that it would, it would um, migrate from Eden to tenured. Uh, tenured, more than likely depending upon the number of garbage collections it reaches. Yeah. And uh, it's a relevant question for me. Uh, what is it about tenured, remind me, that is more expensive to, to clean up? Um, okay, so the cleaning tenured is more expensive because uh, one, you have to maintain a free list, right? Instead of a bump and run on a pointer, it's just basically pointer value, bump it up by, the, and we're done, right? Barriers to, you know, drain caches and things like that. Uh, to do full free list maintenance and to possibly do compaction because of fragmentation, which, and then you have to do the pointer swizzling afterwards as you move things. You can see there's just a lot of very expensive operations there that, uh, that, that you have to, you, there's, that you have to go through in order just to maintain uh, the tenured space. So 
session data. Uh, um, one of the things you do is that if a session hasn't been in use for a while, we might offload it completely. And if it, if somebody happens to come back, then you so you can like store it in a huh, database or, <laughs> or or something like that. So serialize it off to off heap memory. Um, if it's not going to be used for a while, if you're going to continuously be using it, then I would not say don't serialize out of TOF because the expense of serializing and deserialization is going to offset uh, any savings you might get uh, by you know, orders of magnitude, probably. Yeah. Okay. So that's one thing you can do. It's just uh, you know, the, I mean, the, the the I think it's like the five minute rule still applies. If you haven't touched anything in five minutes, it's not likely that you're going to. That's an old caching rule. Right, for cache eviction policies. Oh yeah, and this is really funny. I mean, as a, another aside, I've had so many a couple of discussions now with uh, companies that provide product caches for uh, retail sites, <laughs> right? And the first thing you look at is say, oh, look at your memory is going like this. You know, okay, what are you doing? What do you? Uh, where's the cache eviction policy? Let's check that. And it's like, what do you mean no cache eviction policy? <laughs> so. Essentially, you have these companies selling you a memory leak. Yes. <laughs> Bonus, right? Yeah, so, and then you have arguments with the companies. They're going like, oh, but we're providing a useful product. And you go, yeah, for whom? Amazon, so they can jack their memory bills up or, I don't know. Anyway, it's kind of weird. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, just be aware, you know, uh, memory eviction policy is something that we'll look at. And if you don't have one, probably a sign that you might be using the wrong product. Just saying. Okay. Yes. A uh, couple. Yes. Um, Go ahead. The first uh, optimization you did for not allocating and rather reusing an object. How does that sit with, you know, cleaner code and refactoring your code and also Java 8 and Lambdas? Was the, is that something that you should? You're asking a performance guy about cleaner code. <laughs> yeah, Seriously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or Lambdas and. You know. uh, lambdas. You, you want performance and you're using lambdas? Okay. Uh, I mean, there's early questions about, you know, neighbors and things like that. I, I, you know, honestly, to be honest, I write, I try to write clean code. I'm not going to claim that this one is clean. It isn't. But um, first, I find it's much easier to optimize. And quite frankly, um, if it's well-written code, it's more than likely going to perform well anyways. And it's very likely you're not going to have the memory issues if you thought about writing the clean code just because the clean code is going to be less likely to allocate hot anyways. Okay? So, yeah, so I'm all for clean code, um, uh, you know, and I'll be really happy when someone actually shows me a definition of clean code that we can measure. <laughs> that would be even better because my code is clean. I know it. I know it. Okay. We have another so, question? So uh, for everyone who is trying to solve the problem of like quick GC com GCs or uh, memory leaks with frequent, just GCs, yeah. frequent GCs, and then uh, by just throwing more capacity at it, like you said, AWS, Azure's of the world. Yeah, that helps. Um, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> it helps for a bit. Sometimes that's the answer. It's like, uh, you know, uh, your memory leaks, uh, you're going to run out of memory in three days. You know, double the memory, six days. Six Excellent. Days, yeah. We're almost at the recycle time. Right. Recycle a JVM. Or, or, restart, your, or so, restart your web app. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Just or restart. Yeah, recycle yeah. a VM. You're, you're done. So I mean, uh, one of the garbage collectors coming up is Epsilon, which is you know, is basically no garbage collector in the VM, which means no interference with the allocators, which means they can go like screaming fast. Really nice the mutator threads. Okay, but you know, uh, you know, if you know how, if you know your rate of allocation, you have a tight control over it. It's a technique we use. Just don't run the garbage collector during the day, <laughs> at all. You make the heap big enough that you don't do it. Right? And the Epsilon makes it even better. So now all you have to do is recycle. The only thing you lose is all your hotspot optimizations overnight, so you have to restart from cold in the morning. But guess what? People are working at solving that problem also. So no garbage collector in a VM. Um, you know, there's some really nice use cases for it. Right? But you need to have control of your allocation rates in order to, man to, to be able to do that successfully without popping a lid you know, during uh, production hours. <laughs> Sorry, the people who are trying to solve what problem don't people understand? Are trying to solve the macro problem of capacity management are not oh, right. 
the 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 micro yes yeah, sir yeah i i completely get that uh, that yeah the yeah the people doing capacity planning don't understand the problem and um yeah it's an opportunity for you to help them i guess any other questions here yes i have one uh, concerning the tenuring threshold it's tenuring over, threshold. It's over, yes oh yeah in the back here because okay. uh, it seems that it's a good practice to set it to maximum would absolutely you, would you agree that if most of the time yes or Once you understand what your uh, what your object uh, life cycle looks like, um, you can possibly reset the tenuring threshold to a lower value that will minimize copy costs. Uh, but generally, I just make it bigger and bigger. I, I mean, I, I generally have fight with support groups from larger corporations. Some <laughs> of them are red in color. Um, because the way I configure heap is uh, quite counterintuitive to the what they're told to do on their screen flows when they you know you know you know the questionnaire right do you have this do you have that then do this flow things yeah um, and because they'll look at the configurations and say you shouldn't be doing that so one of the things I often recommend is that young generation should be sometimes four or five or six times the size of tenured space right so that you can make some very nice size survivor spaces and it really, really calms things down quite a bit. And uh, you know, using this technique, we've taken SLA violations down from double digits to like one percent or something like that. So, but it's not the rec it's not the recommended configuration. No one's going to recommend it. But if you follow the data, if you look at what's what Sensum is telling you, and you just do what it tells you, you're going to go there naturally, right? So just throw away your biases and follow the data. That's all I can say. There was a funny, there's a funny story with CMS, right? When, when CMS, they were performance tuning. When it was first came out, they were performance tuning it. <laughs> oh, what right. Was the, what was the <clears throat> threshold? Do you remember? What was the tuning threshold? Uh, the th the I recommendation didn't... was? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, I have a funny story because I was, uh, I was, Heinz and I were the first, and Dr. Heinz Kibbutz, I should met, my co-founder of JCrete. Uh, we were the first non-Sun speakers invited to speak at a Sun event. And so we're talking, somebody asked us a question about garbage collection, and I think Tony had written a document that basically said, <laughs> make the survivor spaces really small to get rid of copy cost. And we looked at that and just followed the data and said, no, that's not going to work. So somebody said, okay, how do you learn more about this? And I said, go to this white paper, read everything that's in there. It was beautifully written. Tony did a wonderful <laughs> job writing it. I said, just do the exact opposite of what it said. <laughs> so all of the sun execs were like going like, oh my God, did he just say that? <laughs> it's like, and Heinz was looking at it, it's like, oh my God, did he just like say that? It's like, oh my. But yeah, that'd be, but really, that was the truth. Yeah, because garbage uh, collection designers they thought that CMS is, if you, if you uh, tenure. They got the cost model wrong. Yeah. Completely. Yeah, if you tenure everything. And they always do. Then, then CMS will take care of it because it's like, uh, you know, it's just free list has just bumped the pointer. But then, you know, having fragmentation, they didn't account for all those things. So it's like the exact opposite for optimization purposes. Yeah. Yes. Um, in case of application holding a lot of data in a heap, say yeah. cache. Yeah. And Don't run the garbage collector, ever. Exactly. <laughs> so would it mean, uh, would it make sense to load this data uh, in memory and then, you know, force GC so that those objects are promoted, while session objects are not promoted? Or is there any other technique that can be used? Uh, generally, every time you, you outsmart the garbage collector, you outsmart it, you've outsmarted yourself. Um, so we generally don't recommend doing things like that. Um, I, I don't know. If you, if, you had, if you have a large data set in memory, generally what we do is we just inventory it, try to figure out, OK, what really needs to be there? And what can we evict? And quite often we find that we can evict quite quite a bit of what's there just to reduce the footprint size. If you can't, then split it between VMs. Make you know several smaller VMs often better than one big one. You know, think, there's, so there's some tricks you can do, or or as I said, just try to configure things so that the garbage collector never really runs uh, for however long you need it uh, to not run for, and then trigger it at night when no one's using the system, or very few people are using the system, or some time when you can tolerate a multi-minute pause time. OK, we're going to take one last question. Oh, really? We're just getting warmed up. Man, she's tough. Excellent. Um, 
So, uh, so you I think you mentioned uh, offhand like uh, this this uh, this thing with the generations is uh, changing in Java 11 or something like that. Generations? Uh, no, I mean G1 is different than th that we have uh, regions, so we can actually do evacuation in G1 that you can't do with uh, generational collectors, um, and. Uh, that seems to, you would think that would seem to help, but again, it comes with its own set of issues in terms of like large object allocations and um, tracking mechanism, maintenance. Remember, I said the card sets, what we use for generational, right? So they use a, I have no clue how it works, um, uh, system for tracking. Uh, point these pointers that they need to track uh, with G1 and the, the, so all of these things are just uh, they tend to be much more expensive but you know CMS has a practical heap size of about four gigs you know some people oversized eight gigs or something like that once you start getting like 16 32 gigs some size like that then you then you're you're, be, you're really beyond the practical scalability of that particular collector, so we, mean, we need to go to something else, and that's, that's G1, or hopefully G ZGC or ZGC. So I forgot which country I'm in. Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so to answer that question, yes, yeah. actually, Oh, yeah, she's ZGC? a garbage collection expert anyway. Z she knows more about it than I do. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, ZGC <laughs> and Shenandoah are both uh, single generation, so they're not... Um, uh, yeah, I would call them time temporal generational. Yes, so, so so just to answer that question, so yes, with JDK 11. Uh, Thanks guys, remember that. to hit the green button. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Excellent.